Welcome back, DP Nation, to another episode. We are absolutely delighted to have you in the studio, however you're here. So listen, grab a pen, grab a notebook, get yourself a cup of coffee, and come along for the journey tonight. Welcome back, DP Nation, and we are absolutely delighted to have you in the studio. And tonight it is going to be Pastor Jeffrey Elder, myself, and Reverend Jordan Pound. Bishop is coming. It is getting very close to Bishop being back home with us, and we are delighted the great things that God has been doing where they are at. There have been powerful Doors that have been open to them, um, doors that only God could open, and we are grateful for that. There's been baptisms. There's been people filled with the Holy Ghost. There has been just a wonderful moving of the Spirit. Here in Pueblo, there's been baptisms. There's been noted, noted miracles that have happened in the last couple weeks. And we pray that God is doing the same for you wherever you are. Tonight, we are going to do something uh, a little bit, um, I don't know that you should say lighthearted when it comes to the Word of God, but we are going to talk about a scripture, and we are also going to deal with a concept, um, and that is, the concept is the exposition of scripture. The verse is Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. so when it comes to reading your Bible, you have uh, some words that you'll probably hear when you get into studying the Bible and you get into studying how you should study the Bible. You will hear the word exegete, and you will hear the word isogete, and then you will hear the word exposit and the word imposit. Um, and so the one we're going to deal with tonight is exposition. And um, So exposition, to exposit something is to pull it, out of so you can exposit gold from the ground it's to pull ground or to pull the gold out of the ground you can exposit minerals from the ground you can exposit diamonds from the earth and then there is imposition which is to impose something into the bible that is not there so a lot of the teaching of the word or the teaching of the doctrine excuse me the teaching of the doctrine of the Trinity is imposition. They are imposing what they want into the text that's not really there. Now, that's a extreme example. But, so we're going to jump into this tonight. The verse is Jeremiah 29, 11. But we'll back up a little bit just to get some context here. So, verse 10 says, For thus saith the Lord... That after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good toward or my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And then verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected in. Then shall you call upon me? And ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search for me with all your heart. So as we open this up, the first thing that really jumps out to me, and Brother Pound and Pastor Jeffrey Elder, you can jump in to this whenever you want. The first thing that jumps out to me out of this verse is it's for I know this is speaking directly of God. Um, he knows. It's God that knows. It's not just anybody. It's not just, you know, your boss, your landlord, your wife, your husband. And all of that comes out of the text immediately. For I know the thoughts 
that I think toward you. Which then poses a question to me. Um, what are the thoughts that God thinks towards me? And do I know those thoughts? And am I actively trying to get an understanding of those thoughts? For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. There's a place in the New Testament that talks about this. The Apostle Paul said, And we know that all things, Romans chapter 8, I believe, And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love him, them that are called according to his purpose. I believe that's a rough quotation. And so there really is an overarching or overarching, excuse me, there really is an overarching plan to all of this. And where do we fit in that plan, young people? Where do you fit? Where do I fit in that plan? Do we know where we fit in that plan? These are all things that, that God is getting at. And when you're reading this, the other thing that we need to understand is the first context of this scripture and that's why i read verse 10 the first context of the scripture is directly to israel um and i bring that up because i've heard several times over the last couple years i've heard people make the mistake of trying to throw this verse out and say this verse isn't talking to me it's not talking to you it's talking to israel and that's been fulfilled so you don't need it well, my question to them is, okay, if it's only to Israel and it's not to us, then why is it still in the Bible? Why did it make the cut if it's not speaking to us? But it is important to note that the first context of this scripture is to Israel. And this was fulfilled in a partial sense after the 70 years in Babylon. They did go back to the land of Israel. So, Brother Jeffrey, Brother Pound, going to open this up, and let's talk about this tonight. Well, this is actually one of uh, an interesting passage of Scripture that I love to preach out of, and not just verse 11, but this entire um, chapter, uh, beginning from verse number one, if you go to the beginning of chapter 29 you will find that this is a letter that is written by jeremiah who was not in babylon um, when he was exiled he did not go to babylon but he was still a prophet of the people of israel and a word would come by him to the people of israel and so from his place of exile he writes a letter to them and he tells of the 70 years of desolation, 70 years in which the land would lay desolate because of their disobedience, because of their disregard of the word of God. And that disregard is the fact that they would not uh, allow the land to rest. So uh, Brother Mitchell just brought up the idea that people even though uh, we are ex uh, trying to come at this from a, a mode of exposition and, and to look at it in the original context, and the first context is to the children of Israel, um, there is a lot to be said to us because we understand that in, in the scriptures, um, I think we talked a little bit about this last week, and we probably talked about it here and there throughout all of our podcasts, but throughout the scriptures, the bringing in of the new covenant is not a, is not a destruction or a deconstruction of the old covenant. It is a fulfillment of the old covenant. And so um, a lot of, the way that we observe the Old Covenant is through the spiritual um, understanding that we we do live under the New Covenant. 
but it does not deconstruct the old covenant, but rather it builds upon. And so it does have a lot to say to us because uh, the idea of allowing the land to rest is, is the idea of the Sabbath. It is the year of Jubilee. And all of that ties very heavily into the message of Pentecost, the Acts 2.38 message. And so it speaks a lot to us. And so with that being said, when we read this scripture, we read it in the understanding that because they would not allow this land to rest, because they would not give it the Sabbath, there is a judgment that comes upon them. And the judgment is that they were exiled from their land and Babylon destroyed the land of, of Israel. They destroyed Jerusalem. And uh, many majority, a vast majority of the people are carried away in exile. There are, there are very few that are left in the land of Israel to live out a meager uh, survival. Uh, can you imagine trying to survive in a land with a decimated economy, uh, a decimated, uh, com uh, the complete system is decimated. The, the, the system of travel, the system of government, the economy. Anyway, that, that's probably another uh, conversation for another time, but it's just something to think about when reading this text. And so we read down through this whole uh, text, verses 1 through 4. It's talking about the letter and 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 who the letter is to and where it comes from. And, and in all of that, verse number four says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Now, I love this scripture right here because even in their uh, mode of living in the land of Babylon, Bible does not give them room to, uh, we read in one place, I believe it's in the book of Psalms, that the Bible says that they, there by the river, they sat and they hung their harps on the willows and they wept because they were not at home. But this scripture does not give them room for that. This is, that is an idea of like a, Poor little me mentality. Oh, we're living in Babylon. Uh, poor us. We, you know, we don't deserve this when in all reality they did deserve it. And the Bible says in verse 5, Build ye houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat fruit of them. Uh, take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husband that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. So we won't spend a lot of time here, but God is not giving them room to sit on the banks of some cry, crybaby river. He is giving, he is telling them, while you're living in this land, it is time for you to become great. Build houses, take wives, take wives for your sons, let your daughters be married and have children. That in this time, in this time of, of uh, we could say this time of setback or this time of withholding, that your families will not be diminished. And, you know, there's so much more that we can go into. Uh, and seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused thee to be carried away captive and pray unto the Lord for it. For, the, for in the peace thereof ye shall have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Neither hearken to your dreams, which ye have caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name and have not, and I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Now, 
I mean, there's so much to preach and talk about and have incredible podcasts about in this. But first off, I don't want to take up all the airtime uh, because Brother Mitchell has a lot better things to say than I do. That's for sure. <laughs> but I mean, this is just incredible. All of this speaks to in these moments uh, for us, originally for them as the children of Israel. But again, it speaks to us, speaks to us in these moments for us not to sit down and be silent, and be quiet and, and, you know, live in some mode of, uh, you know, of silence, but it is in these moments for us to rise up and to uh, become great and be, become the people of God that God has intended for us to become. So with all that being said, this brings us to verse number 10 that Brother Mitchell began to read. For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. And then one of our favorite passages of scripture right here. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. When you read that scripture in the full context of Jeremiah chapter 29, it opens a whole new world because a lot of the denominal world, uh, they will separate the scripture out and, uh, you know, and, and talk about it in a, a very, uh, I would say in a very shallow way, um, you know, and there's 50,000 ways that they could talk about it, talk about it. Uh, in a sense of of uh, antinomian grace, um, they will talk about it in a sense of of predestination. They will talk about it in all of these senses, but that is not fitting the context of what the scripture is saying. And so, uh, there's so much to be added when you read this in the full context of Jeremiah 29. It's also interesting, you can actually turn, and this goes right along with, I know we're kind of doing two things. We're talking about a, a wonderful passage of Scripture. We're also dealing with the idea of exposition, properly expositing the Word of God, um, which some people would say, well, that's, I don't need to do that. I'm not a preacher. Well, um, you do need to do that because you'll see this in this text. Right here, it's, it is important that we all do this. You can go to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. And Daniel says this, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, the numbers of the years whereof the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And he begins to lay out, um, he continues on. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, you know, etc. He goes into his prayer. But what you see is because Daniel had his nose in the book, he began to understand where he was. He began to understand the time that he was in. And so on one hand, you have Jeremiah the prophet begins to prophesy this powerful and beautiful passage of scripture that says, yes, there will be judgment. But then there will be mercy mixed with that judgment. And then because of a man who understands how to properly exposit, how to properly draw out of the scriptures what's being said, 
You have Daniel. You have Jeremiah prophesying to the people in Babylon. But now you have Daniel in Babylon saying, because I had my nose in the book and I was doing things right, then I begin to understand where I was. I begin to understand the time that I was in and I begin to understand the next things that were going to take place, the next things that were going to come upon my nation. And because of that, he says, I set my face and Daniel begins to repent for his nation and say, God, you made a promise to this nation through the prophet Jeremiah. And I'm asking you to honor that promise and I'm asking you to forgive my nation. So that's why it's important, DP Nation, that yes, you understand that Jeremiah is speaking to you, but also you understand the idea of it of expositing the word of God and reading the word of God and understanding it because it will show you where you are standing. It will show you the time that you were in. It will show you um, the things that are to come. And I'm not talking about, you know, some people, they get all kind of crazy with the Bible and they see, you know, a prophecy in, in, in every fifth word and the fifth letter of the fifth word and you then you divide by 72 and you I'm not that's not what I'm talking about what I'm talking about is when you properly exposit the text it begins to show you what David said David said thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path the word of God shows you where you're standing and it shows you your next steps it's the lamp to show you where your feet are, but it's also the light to show you where you need to go. And so in Jeremiah, it's saying that I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of good and out of evil, to give you an expected end. There's a destination that God has in mind for you. And so you have Daniel, however many hundreds of miles away, begins to read this and he uh, he begins to understand okay we're coming to the end of these 70 years and what can I do to begin to position myself for that expected end there's a place that God wants me there's a place that God needs me now it's behooving to Daniel to search his heart and begin to repent for his nation to make sure that they're hitting that expected end that came, for it first came because Jeremiah was walking in the Spirit and God began to prophesy through him. But it also came to Daniel because of a man who was willing to learn how to properly, and I don't know if Daniel would say this, but we would say Daniel learning to properly exposit God's Word, what God is saying out of the text. And so... It, Jeremiah 29, 11 spoke to Daniel. In fact, when you keep reading verse 13 of Jeremiah, it says, it talks about that you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And that's what Daniel does in Daniel 9. He's fasting. He's in sackcloth. He's in ashes. He's in a state of repentance. Um, he's in a state of mourning. He's in a state of deep repentance for his nation. He is doing his best. To fulfill Jeremiah 29, 13, because he understands if I fulfill this, then God will keep his end of the deal, which is you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. I, I want to go back to that, that phrase, an expected end, because it, it's, I think it plays a huge role in our lives as apostolics okay so we're talking about properly um, properly uh, using the scripture and 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 not pulling it out of it its original context and and in the in what i said earlier there's so many ways that people use this in a in a false doctrinal sense I mentioned a couple um, antinomian grace uh, 
a doctrine of predestination or uh, what what they would fuzzily term as once saved always saved and they will use that scripture out of the context and say you know well there it is you know um we we can be predestinated unto righteousness uh or unto destruction and 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 that totally negates the proper context of the scripture because this is talking about the people of of god going home back to their uh rightful place they as rightful heirs yeah and 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 this is where a lot of what we're talking about right now comes into play because uh people that are not properly defining the scripture and properly uh expositing the scripture will begin to pick and choose texts out of the bible and they will piece and 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 piece them together and put them together and they will then uh formulate some uh, improper doctrine out of the scripture but the first way that we understand this is that God is prophesying to this people that they are going to go home. And uh, again, that speaks to us. That speaks to us as apostolics today because there is a promise to us that we will go home. And there is an expected end for us, okay, as the people of God, as the church, we that are in the church, we will go home. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know how far we want to get into this, but um, if you get out of the church, which you can step out of the, the boundaries of the church, you can step out of the boundaries of the grace of God, you can step out of the boundaries of salvation then you will lose this promise but those of us that are the people of god the children of god the church today we will we do have a promise that we will go home uh first thessalonians 4 and 17 uh, the, the scripture speaks of this i'm going to get there very quickly First Thessalonians chapter four, and verse number seventeen. Uh, <clears throat> then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, I'm going off notes that I have written here in jeremiah 29 11 so i gotta i gotta go back there <laughs> let's go to uh john chapter 14 and verse number two let not your heart be troubled i'll start at verse number one believe in god you believe in god believe also in me and my father's house for many mansions if it were not so I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And then, yeah. you know, the rest of, of one of our favorite scriptures in the Bible, John chapter 14, as oneness people. But then again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 19. First <clears throat> Corinthians 15 and 19. If in this life we have hope. Uh, if in this life only we have hope in Christ. We have all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And become first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. Uh, uh, 
and you know we we go deep into that tonight but the the point is made that uh we're not we're not just in this babylonian uh this babylonian form of government and we're not stuck here we're not going to be here forever but we do have a hope beyond this it is a hope of an expected end it is a hope that we don't have to live in this life forever and then one final scripture here acts chapter 1 verse number 11 which also said you men of galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into the heaven and and we we realize that and we understand that that is a promise that we don't have to be we don't have to be stuck in this babylonian form of government forever there is an expected end to us that are the people of God, the children of God and the church. And there is an expected end for us. So, uh, you know, there, there's an importance. There's an importance to us to not just take the scripture. You know, this is, this scripture is plastered on every plaque in every Bible bookstore from here to South Korea, you know, it's just, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it's in every translation. It's in every, uh, every version of the Bible ever created, you know, and every different version is so, you know, it's so touching and so uh, <clears throat> moving. Uh, what the NIV says, for I know the plans that I have for you, say God. Plans to prosper you. Plans never to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, beautiful songs written about this, this scripture. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not bashing all of that. I think it's amazing. The scripture does bring encouragement. But the scripture can be twisted in such a way, in such a manner, that it, it it will destroy and negate the promise of this scripture. Yeah. There is an expected end for us. And there is a hope and a future for us. Another thing with that is, and this is just going back to the, where they will try to say, they will talk about the predestination, um, which the church is predestined. And that teaching comes from the apostle Paul. But they try to take this into the extreme of the predestination of the individual. Yeah. But DP Nation, to do that with this scripture is to err because you have to actually back up and realize that Israel is not, they were not predestined for Babylon. Their disobedience led them into Babylon. Um, so... God's original plan with Israel was not Babylon. Babylon is the judgment because they refused to keep the Sabbath. They refused to keep the land, the rest for the land. They refused to keep the years of Jubilee. They refused to obey the commandments and the laws of God. And so they are sent into Babylonian captivity. The beauty of the scripture is not that you're predestined to go to heaven um, regardless of what you do, the beauty of the scripture is the grace of God that is saying, yes, you went into Babylon, but I am going to redeem you because of my love for you. And in fact, you see this um, probably what we should call one of the great themes of scripture um, is the theme of redemption. You see the same thing with Adam. Adam is not destined he is not predestined for sin he has the choice to sin 
And so because of his disobedience to the law, just like Israel disobeyed and they go into the judgment of God in Babylon, Adam sins, he disobeys the command of God, and he's driven out of the Garden of Eden. He's driven into the desolation of sin. But there is the promise that's given to Eve that there is redemption coming and there is a way out of this. So when people try to take that scripture and say, well, see, we're predestined. It's an expected end. Well, it's an expected end. Yes, God expects you there. But that doesn't mean you're going to get there just by happenstance. We as Christians... We as lovers of truth have to make the right decisions every day, day by day, hour by hour. We've got to make the right decisions to get to that place. You know, my, uh, my boss expects me to be at work tomorrow. That doesn't mean that I'm just going to be there. If I'm yeah. predestined to be at work, then it don't matter what I do. I'm just going to show up at work. I could stay in bed and still get there. Yeah, I could just lay, you know, not brush my teeth, not comb my hair. Don't even have to set an alarm, and then all of a sudden I'll just, poof, I'll be there. Poof. Poof. I'll be there like pulling a <laughs> rabbit out of a hat. But you that's predestination. What the scripture is saying is to give you an expected. God expects to see you in heaven, but it's up to you and I to make sure we get there. Yeah. Well, that I mean, that's exactly right. The the expectation of God for us to be there is not the uh, is not the automatic. Uh, it's not the automatic uh, magical wand that waves it. You know, we, we will be there, and 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 a lot of their language in that is so deceptive. It is so deceptive. Um, you know, the, the language that, well, you know, it, it, you can't, you can't, uh, lose your salvation. It's not, it's not a, a salvation that can be lost. Well, when you read the book of Romans, which is, you know, where they love to, to, to stay in that idea of the, the grace of God. The book of Romans talks and deals with the idea of uh, ad nauseum of the fact that whether you are walking after the spirit or walking after the flesh, that is what that is the fruit that you will bear. For they that are of the spirit do mind the things of the spirit, but they that are of the flesh, the things of the flesh. And then, you know, their favorite when you go to the book of Ephesians, uh, in fact, just the other day, I had someone tell me, uh, you know, well, was is the book of Ephesians wrong when it says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his, of his will, uh, to the praise and the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. No, of course not. I'm not, we're not afraid of that scripture. Um. Uh, there is not any scripture in the Bible that is accidentally there or not supposed to be there. That is not, we are, we are not afraid of those scriptures. But again, in that idea, the whole book of Ephesians is written to the church as a whole, initially, context, contextually. It is written to the church as a whole. And, uh, and, and, and God had, God has predestinated the church as a whole. But that predestination of the church is not, again, what Brother Mitchell said, a predestination of the individual. Because uh, I believe when you get into the book of James and it begins to deal with the idea of uh, of and I don't want to get out over my skis here because uh, it's been a while since I read this, but the the idea uh, that we are 
that we cannot work enough for salvation, right? That's that's one of their big deals when we talk about uh, predestination. Well, we're we're not saved by uh, works; we're saved by grace. Well, when we get to the book of James, he deals with the idea that we are justified by our works. We are justified by our actions. Uh, James chapter chapter two, and, and we've dealt with this at nauseum, but. I think we're really kind of bringing this all full circle, the things that we've dealt with in previous podcasts, because these are the ideas that can come out of scriptures like Jeremiah 29, and, and, and they can, can uh, grow to be huge doctrines and and they're not they're not based in scripture they're not based in the ideas of scripture at all so uh, we have to be careful we have to uh, the bible says uh, i believe it says it like this take the more earnest heed to the things which we have learned yeah well, DP Nation, we hope that this has blessed you and encouraged you. Um, I know that it seems like we were a little bit from Genesis to Revelation, but really what we were hoping to exemplify to you and to ourselves is the necessity of correctly, as the Apostle Paul told Timothy, to rightly divide the word of truth and Exposition is not just some theological term that's kicked around in the halls of seminary, but to the believer, to the everyday Christian, to you and I, to the lovers of truth and those that seek to be true Christians, we must correctly exposit the word of God. And we don't always get it right. And this is something that we strive for. But this is why we need to be with our noses in the book every day, doing the best that we can to exposit. So, first of all, like the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, take heed to thyself and to the doctrine that, I'm paraphrasing, but to the doctrine that you preach. For in doing so, you'll save yourself and those that hear you. And so if we're in the book every day and we're doing it right, we're not forcing the Bible to agree to our ideas, but we're forcing our ideas to agree to the word of God. Then it will first save us. And then also when the doors of opportunity open, then we can begin to speak the word of truth into others' lives and it will help to bring salvation to them as well. So we love you. We pray this blesses you. If it did, share it with somebody. Send it to somebody you know, somebody that it will bless them as well. God bless you and we'll catch you on the next one.